Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Cabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Cool. Naomi, we are here in your living room in front of your gong, and we are about to drop in. I was thinking before we drop in, maybe just a few breaths. Does that sound good? Sounds great. All right, cool. So for all you guys listening, if you're driving, you can obviously follow along with your breath. Just don't close your eyes or anything like that if you're driving. Pretty obvious. But good advice. We'll just, yeah, good advice. We'll, we'll tune into the frequency. If you're washing your dishes, out on a walk, anything like that at all, you can just join us through the breath. And here we go. For anyone listening, starting to get settled, finding a seat, closing down the eyes. Finding an inhale through the nose, inhaling all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top, and through the mouth, exhaling. Another slow inhale all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding the breath. Rolling back the eyes towards the third eye. And audible sigh, let it go. And last one, big inhale all the way up. Sipping in a bit more. Rolling back the eyes. And release. All right, we are here. We're here. Sweet. Well, thank you for a great Kundalini class this morning. You got it. O over in Santa Cruz Capitola, actually, it'd be technical. I'm excited to sit down with you and hear a little bit more about your journey, Kundalini, maybe ETs, all the things, you know? <laughs> I'm sure we'll cover as much as possible. Sounds good. So let's start with uh, Kundalini. You were telling me before we hit record that you grew up in doing dancing, acting, things like that. And then you kind of found yoga and liked it in terms of a vinyasa flow because it's similar to yoga. But how did Kundalini find you? It was really funny because, gosh, I don't know how many, I guess it was back in 2009 or 10. And I was with um, my partner at the time. We we're really getting into it a lot, you know, back and forth, just every other day fighting and arguing and I had stopped doing yoga and I feel like I contribute a lot of like you know some of the agitation and irritation in our relationship to the fact that I didn't have a personal practice and in one of our arguments he said to me go back and why don't you go to yoga <laughs> <laughs> and I was like fine I will <laughs> and I did but I wanted to try something different and I just Googled Yoga Santa Cruz, and the first thing that popped up was Kundalini Yoga Santa Cruz. And I was like, what is that? And I felt like I knew what Kundalini was, and I thought it was something sexual. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, okay. That's fair, because it comes from Tantra, and that was probably your intuition tapping into that. Yeah, I was like, I think I've heard of this, and I think it's something sexy. Hmm. So I thought, it, I, you know, so I showed up to this class, with, you know, 
like as if I was going to like a party. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, yoga party, but yeah, still, like, still, you yeah. Know. <laughs> and my teacher um, is uh, his lineage is from northern India. He's an Indian man. He was in full bana head to toe, which is the sacred um, sacred clothing. Um, all white. All white head to toe in what is called a chola or a man dress. You know, um, it's he's a Sikh, and so the Sikh men. Their bonnet is a is a is like a man dress, um, but it goes to past their knees, and then they wear um, the pants with it, and a big sword, a big sword. Sword. Kanda. It's a when you're a Sikh, there are the five Ks, and I'm, um, gosh, it's been a while, so I I probably won't be able to pull them all forward. But um, anyways, he had a big turban on, the sword, the white man dress. And I'm in this like yoga rave outfit. <laughs> right. And when I walked in, I was like, oh, this is not some sexy yoga thing going on. And I like literally was backing out to go away to leave the class. Like I was going to book it out of there. And he, thank God, he was like, hi, and caught me right when I was on the way out the door. And he's like, what's your name? How, you know, he like, I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, and, and he ended up being my teacher for many, many years until he moved away. Wow. Um, so that first yoga class, that first Kundalini yoga class, I mean, it was nothing like what I was expecting. And when we were arms 60 degrees doing the breath work, I started bawling and tingling all these sensations. Like I was in another world after all the chanting that everyone was doing. I'm like, what is going on here? But I loved it. And I knew how I felt, which was very m good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, things were happening. It felt like things were awakening within me. And so I studied with him for a, a few years before he left to go live with his teacher. And I was, and he was the only one teaching in this area. So mm. as he was leaving, I said, um, how do I learn how to at least do this myself? And he sent me to his teachers. And then I became a teacher myself. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> cool to hear that. And at that time, back in 2010, when you uh, went to your first Kundalini class, were you already teaching yoga? At no, the time? not at all. But you were doing a lot of yoga. I had been doing yoga. I had been doing the Hatha and Vinyasa yoga for many years and then um, had stopped. It's mm. I, I don't know what happened. I, I, we went on tour. And, um, I was in a traveling musical band. And so that's, you know, that's what my focus was. And so I dropped my practice and then my partner and I going at it, him saying that to me sparked this new trajectory in my timeline. So, um, mm, but yeah. I was not teaching at all. No, I was ne I never even thought I would ever teach yoga actually. Right. Yeah. I mean, I taught yoga for about a year. I don't really teach anymore. I can, but not regular class, but even just signing up for yoga teacher training, I was like, yeah, no, I'm, 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 no. And then when I finally did sign up, I was like, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm for my own, like my own work and not to teach. And then I realized I wasn't showing up the right way. So I was like, okay, I need to do this as if I want to teach. And it was so interesting. I did immersive in Costa Rica and by like probably the third day of the training, I was like, no, I definitely want to teach. <laughs> you know, I would have never seen myself teaching yoga or leading breath work as I do now. So it is interesting how our life is going in one direction growing up in a lot of ways you mentioned the matrix this morning and you know we could call the matrix or 3d living not being awake to spirituality and just conditioning and programming and just kind of putting like anything spiritual aside and just be like oh that's woo like what, what, what those hippies <laughs> or whatever and then be like oh wait that's the way right um to a certain extent so having said that what i'd like to get into is what is kundalini because that's probably the first thing that we should address you know there's going to be a lot of people listening that are either familiar with kundalini they've practiced it they've heard about it or even some people that may not have even heard about kundalini so could you give us kind of like an overview yeah, that's a great question. We should start there. Yeah, yeah. it would make sense, right? Versus just diving into yeah, Kundalini. Yeah. People will be like, wait, what is this thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crying and your arms are up and, and sword. <laughs> yeah. Well, the word Kundal. Kundal is the coil. Some refer to it as the lock of hair, actually. Um, and it's, re it's in reference to the coil of energy that's at the base of the spine which is inherent in everybody's body. 
they refer to it as the Shakti energy or the primal, the Adi Shakti, the primal energy. And in most humans that it lays do dormant. It lays dormant, maybe many, many lifetimes it lays dormant. And when, once we start priming the body and our minds to create the right conditions for the energy to s be stimulated, um, then it starts moving. Then it starts moving. And then to various degrees, like some people will attend, for example, a Kundalini yoga class, and they'll just notice, like my, that, how I shared with my first class, I just was tingling a little bit and had things open and I, was, I felt more aware and awake, but I didn't have the energy like fully awakened, so to speak. It was just a gentle stimulation. And um, other people will experience a total full blast awakening without ever having done anything yogic-like mm -hmm. at all. Other people will experience the awakening through what is referred to as Shaktipat, where a teacher that has an awakened Kundalini will maybe even just simply touch them or pat their head. Or you see it actually in um, the churches, the, um, I forget the name of that, those style of churches, but they're like, woo, you know, <laughs> they've got their arms up, they're shaking like crazy, and the pastor comes and touches their head. Like, that's kundalini energy, too. Fascinating. Yeah. Wow. There's actually an incredible YouTube video out there where this man, he's got an Australian accent, and he's like, beware of the kundalini, and he's <laughs> showing all these, these examples of people going nuts in church. <laughs> Anyways, um, and then, so what it does, when it gets stimulated, it will travel through your nadis, your your energy centers, and we have everybody has three main channels of energy, and the two that go um, weaving in out like a DNA helix will um, eventually end up at the third eye space, Shiva and Shakti, and also what's beautiful is that that's where each of our chakras are located. And the Shishmana, which is the central meridian, the main channel, goes through each of those chakras. And if you've seen a mandala um, depicted depicting each chakra, you'll see at the very center is a tiny, sometimes it's larger, but you'll see a tiny hole, a black hole. And that is, um, that is my understanding of it, it is the center of the toroidal energy that spins out and around. And when you get to the heart, it really goes out, it feeds our aura. So when we stimulate this lock, this lock of hair or a coil at the base of the spine, it travels up our spine and eventually we want it to rise. It doesn't just rise though, it rises and it goes down and it moves. And when we have an obstruction or a block, so to speak, in one of our chakras or an area of our body, if she's awakened in you and you're connected to her, I refer to her as her, <laughs> but the her Kundalini. Her being Shakti that yes. sits at the root. Yeah. yeah, when she's moving, say she'll move and all of a sudden people will report saying, oh, I had this heat or this pressure. She comes to me as a pressure in the top of my head. And when she does that, it is a, she is communicating with you, mm -hmm. saying there is something here to pay attention to there's either a block or she's trying to move and clear something for you. So it's this beautiful relationship. I want to also share that in different lineages. So for example, I went to a Vipassana retreat, the 10 day silent retreat, and we weren't allowed to do any yoga of any sorts. You could walk, but then it was just the Vipassana meditation, eat, sleep, repeat. So I didn't do any Kundalini yoga there. And I had a full, it was so, I had a full blown awakening and I had been wanting one for 10 years practicing Kundalini. It never happened. <laughs> the moment I put Kundalini down and I do this other thing, it's like, and it was scary. And it was like, I was like, is this really happening? You know, it was, it was real. And um, when I went to the teacher, you know, they give you like a five minute window to talk to somebody if you're going through something. Mm -hmm. And so um, the day after I had this experience, I wanted to talk to the teacher. And what she shared was, um, she asked me to please not refer to it as Kundalini, actually. She said, here we refer to it as the truth revealing itself, which felt even more powerful mm -hmm. because that's what it is. 
wild. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So much to unpack there. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let me just recap a few things that so we're all on the same page and we're getting this to activate the dormant energy that sits at the root of the uh, the root of the spine the root chakra and making its way up to the third eye shakti making her way up to shiva this whole purpose or this kundalini energy the first big question that i think we could address then we can go into the other ones is is a kundalini awakening the same as an awakening? Uh, to your person's point of not calling it a kundalini, like we can so easily call something one thing or another. Mm -hmm. And I work with the medicine Bufo, 5-MeO, DMT a lot. And I've also sat with ayahuasca, mushroom ceremonies, and a lot of different psychedelics, right? And to me, it feels like kundalini is giving you in a or sorry bufo is giving you a kundalini awakening because many times straight when someone sits with bufo that is straight to source if we're, you know not to i'm generalizing but a lot of times people will feel oh i am you you're me we're split off in separation infinity time doesn't exist it starts to be a manifestation mess and we're you're more awake and living in the dream and that seems to be very much in alignment with a kundalini awakening so i know that's that's a lot there so i'll just hand it to you how about that <laughs> I, those medicines i believe that's what they're what they do is they'll awaken someone's kundalini um and and then people can have an awakening where they have maybe like epiphanies um, or those aha moments or those dark nights of the soul. And those I consider awakenings too. Right. A spontaneous uh, awakening. Yeah. 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 Um, but there's something very visceral about a Kundalini awakening. Um, a lot of people experience it as extreme pain actually. Um, and it can be very scary. Like I, um, used to not as much anymore, but I used to have a lot of people from all over the world contact me because they found, they did a search for Kundalini and they found my name or my videos and asked me for help because, I mean, they, and they weren't yogis, they weren't practitioners, they didn't do plant medicine, they were just experiencing this thing that finally after enough research they realized they were having a Kundalini awakening and it was painful. Um, so if we haven't conditioned the body and primed ourselves on, and done enough like shadow work and you know work on our mindset it can be very painful um like ripping off like a, a massive ego death you know? it, it, absolutely and when you say painful can you speak to that a little, little mm -hmm. bit in terms of what those symptoms might look like yeah some people experience like a burning sensation in their nervous system some people experience like i had the pressure the immense pressure like it feels like somebody's like punching the top of your head or pushing at it and um, other people experience numbness and tingling or extreme heat and extreme chills not able to sleep at night and then a wave of the most orgasmic bliss will also come over you so it's 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 everything <laughs> it, it's it's so fascinating to me because i've been working with bufo now for maybe four years or, or so and i have a lot of clients that i do integration work that I've sat with the mess and they're experiencing similar symptoms to what you mentioned, which is where I've been seeing this correlation. Mm -hmm. And the other part to this was you mentioned Shakti pot and Kundalini. So if we were to kind of zoom out and look at yoga, um, and you know, I'm just going to say what I kind of know and then defer you and we'll have a conversation, but it's like, um, yoga at the top i forget what the terminology is but then there's hatha is that right and the other one's tantra and then you go down to the different sides from there did i explain that right no i have no idea oh okay this is uh, so my understanding was like a typical vinyasa class would come from hatha and then like the mm -hmm. other big branch of yoga would be tantra and then mm -hmm. kundalini is underneath there and then one way to activate the kundalini energy within you and prepare safely, like you said. So if you do have a spontaneous awakening or kundalini awakening that your chakras are cleansed is going through like kundalini yoga. Whereas the other path is shakti pot. 
Shakti pot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's what the guru, guru that could just like touch you. And right now we're seeing um, CAP practitioners pop up all over the place, which is an acronym that stands for Kundalini Activation Process. Hmm. And it's so fascinating because the first CAP class I did was on a Zoom uh, Zoom. Uh, it was on Zoom. And why am I trying to say a Zoom class or something? It was on a Zoom class. It was on. It was on the Zoom. It was on the Zoom. How the about Zoom, that? Yeah. It was in the Zoom. Yeah, yeah. It's in the computer. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, uh, I did this about a year ago, uh, almost to the date of this recording, just a few weeks. Uh, miss, um, and this person, the practitioner, or I guess the facilitator, she was uh, in Florida and I'm in California and there was maybe five, 10 other people on it. Mm -hmm. And she played a playlist and it was like, you know, Trevor Hall and <laughs> some other songs that you know. And But she did edit them so they kind of like formed into one another. It wasn't like she just put songs on a playlist. But I left that Zoom being like, what the heck was that? <laughs> Did <laughs> like, anything shift for you or open up? Or so what? this is the fascinating part. <laughs> uh, last year was the most challenging year of my life. That's the story, right? But there's truth in that. And when I traced back maybe a month or two after that cap class, it was within the next half hour that the events set off what would make it the most challenging part. And that blew my mind. I was like, because nothing happened like you know it's mm -hmm. a playlist that anyways so point in bringing this up is when we talk about medicines whether it's ayahuasca mushrooms or specifically what i'm bringing to the table with bufo is bufo seems more in alignment with the shakti pot where it's like you might not have been doing the shadow work right and then now you're experiencing all these symptoms and the other way i've heard kundalini described is like the lower three sh uh, chakras or chakras is where all the shadow work is. And then when you clear that out, the heart gets activated and then the three above that come online. So why it's so hard for people with like a bufo uh, ceremony would be because they're getting blasted open with their heart and it's bypassing the lower three. Then in the integration, you have to now backtrack and do all the work for the lower three. So I'd love to hear what's coming up for you with this topic. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. So with the chakra system, there's a lower triangle and the upper triangle and they, they do come to the vortex point at the heart. And so, yes, to pick up, but I will say there's shadow to each of the chakras. That makes sense, mm -hmm. yeah. So, for example, in the heart, we think the heart is so open and positive, but a sh the shadow of the heart would be closed closed heartedness or lack of compassion or since it's associated with the lungs and which is a grief and attachment like a hard time letting go of something um so that would be the shadow of the heart chakra so, uh, and, but typically as you mentioned the first three chakras in the lower triangle are the densest they're the heaviest they're the hardest to move through and they're most they're the most prevalent in societies mm -hmm. fear insecurity doubt worry um you know just a lack of connection to self and then you go up from there but yes absolutely things can get bypassed when we um when we ex when we go the shakti pot route like whether it's a whether it's plant medicine or something you know and at the same time i also trust divine order yeah that's <laughs> so true too. if you have to like go there and then reverse engineer everything <laughs> yeah, yeah it can bring stuff up but yeah uh yeah that's an interesting point to make that there's uh the, the lower chakra um, the lower three chakras ha tend to be where we get stuck the most. So when you've seen people reach out to you with pain and the symptoms, would you say they've normally been tied to the lower three chakras? Yes. And it was usually, I would ask them, and it usually was paralleling some major transitions in their life or they were needing to change their life after being stuck in something for a decade or more and weren't. And then she swooped in and caused this ma massive shift in their life and it opened everything up. And there's a shadow to that too, in a sense where once she's activated in you, you have to be very uh, mindful because there's a certain, like it can be, lead to pridefulness and I actually worked with somebody who had tremendous um, arrogance 
and like a God complex. Yeah, we see that a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got to always be mindful of the, uh, as we do our work. What advice would you give to someone that is in resistance of hmm. when those symptoms are coming? Mm-hmm. And because it's so easy on the outside for us to, you know, see it and then try to guide them to the answer. So we're not telling them. So they figure it out for themselves because you can tell someone something a million times, but until they figure it out for themselves, mm-hmm. not going to really change. So it, maybe there's a specific example you could think about, uh, that comes to mind. If not, that's totally cool too. I'm just curious if there is. The advice I would give is the advice that was given to me, which was, and that was in Vipassana, the teacher, when she said, this is the truth revealing itself. And then she went on to say, don't crave it and do not avert it. Both will lead to suffering. Um, And I will say that the craving was very, very strong because she felt so good and, you know, (laughs) I just always wanted to feel like that. Um, But when you release and find yourself free of either of those polarities in a sense, um, you can develop a relationship with the energy where you communicate. I do a lot of work with Gestalt and Gestalt is giving voice to things. And so you can literally give a voice to the energy and ask her what she wants you to know. Mm. And she's very telepathic in that way because you and her are one and the same in that sense, the truth, right? And so you can develop, that would be my advice to come to the center, neutralize yourself, free yourself from the, the resistance or the aversion, free yourself from the craving and allow her to reveal herself when she will and trust that she will when she when it's right and then develop a relationship with her in your own way in your own language however that feels right for you but giving voice to things is is very powerful practice i love that thank you for sharing Mm -hmm. and in terms of like learning to work with your intuition because i'm just thinking of uh, the people that my it's going to be bufa more in shakti pot i think someone who's doing shakti pot or a cap session's a little bit probably more doing the work if they know about something like that you know versus bufa they might have just heard from a friend or mike tyson or something like that and be like oh is that the toad like oh i, I want to try that and be like well it's not really something you try you know you're going all in right but point being <laughs> for those people right those people that are like newer on the path it's very challenging to build your intuition. It's still something that I struggle with. You know, I'm a big fan of internal family systems, parts work, Mm -hmm. great stuff. And it's uh, even Michael Singer's work talking about the witness and, you know, the roommate in your head and all that, but it can be challenging for us to figure out like, Oh, is that, is that her as in Shakti coming here to help me reveal something? Or is that like my adversarial voice or one of my parts coming in? You know, Mm -hmm. such a good point. Um, Just if anything's coming through. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Um, Well, I love that you brought up the, um, what is it? The internal family system? Yeah, yeah. Because that's what, that's basically a modernized version of Gestalt. Oh, cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sweet. So it's part, Gestalt is parts work. And Fritz Perlis um, was like the founding father, if you will, of that s- s- psychological modality. And so it's r- great to see so many pra- people practicing the parts work. And really, it's, it's this form of Gestalt, which Gestalt is a German word that just means, uh, not just, it means wholeness, mm. completion, and resolve. So um, how do we differentiate? How do we build our intuition to distinguish between a voice that might be a part of ourselves that, you know, you know, might be still wounded or on, on the ego spectrum versus, versus the truth versus the intuition and the heart voice. And one thing I've learned, um, I actually have a little step-by-step thing here. This might be helpful. The soul's voice, We'll call the soul's voice. The soul's voice is never complicated. It won't complicate things for you. We do that. So if you're complicating things, if you're wavering, because the soul's voice is also very consistent, 
So it won't flip flop and analyze things. Oh, maybe this or maybe that. You won't be hemming and hawing. That's not your soul's voice either. Your soul's voice is also very spontaneous. It's not from the past. It's not from anything that's like a karmic loop. It's like it might come out of thin air. Like what? And that's usually your soul's voice, you know. And then it's um, never critical. Mm. It's always very kind, and it's always, always very simple. And sometimes that's very frustrating to the human mind because we like to complicate things. And it's just, what? No, it can't be that simple. But yes, at the root of it, it's that simple. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. And it's it's like looking into a mirror. I don't know how many times I've, I've said, you know, as humans, we do as humans do and we overcomplicate things. But at the end of the day, it's all so simple. And the first night of my first ayahuasca ceremony, I just rem remember all night, like until I fell asleep, it's all so simple. It's all so simple. And it's, it's like, it's, it's nuts how much we overcomplicate things as humans and it's okay too, you know? And I think that's such great advice. So for everyone listening, just to soak that in when you're really trying to discern between your higher self or shock, shock D or your intuition, remember that it's simple. Mm -hmm. It's also fast fast yeah if you go thinking too long you're in your rational mind mm -hmm. so um my teacher used to say lightning fast like within nine <clears throat> seconds if you don't receive something like switch like reset move your mind go somewhere else for a minute and then revisit it another thing that's very consistent so uh one of my intuition teachers she would say ask wait but don't go too long receive the answer confirm it two more times those the second and third time you might get a little bit more or an elaboration on your question but it will be consistent it won't negate the first thing that came through mm -hmm. so that's another cool trick and you did this in uh the kundalini this morning in class and i really liked it i think it was when you put us in um child's pose and it was to like have a mantra come through or something along those lines and myself i was telling you this before we hit record being very analytical and the, this is why i ask these questions because i'm like oh i know there's other people like this too where you know we tend to gaslight ourselves mm. right and that's what it's all about so i forget how you cued it and you prompted it but like i had the thing come through and i was like boom that's it and then already my adversarial <laughs> voice came in and was like well maybe it's this and then right in that moment you said like lightning fast it's going to come through and i was like that's what i needed <laughs> you know <laughs> so it's just it's such good advice like it does come through quick and you can feel that and yeah so much to talk about there uh so that was a fun rabbit hole thank you mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. always <laughs> yeah kundalini so we, we, you, you kind of mentioned, you know, it's dangerous, right? And there's this, uh, there's this YouTube video with, um, what's his name? Uh, Sadhguru. Um, it's a famous one. I don't know how many millions of views it has. It's probably like 10 minutes long, but I went to go do a Kundalini training, which is a whole nother story that uh, I'll get into another time. But I remember, uh, telling my parents about it before I went off to go to Bali to do this. I was like, this is what I'm doing here. Watch this. And he's sitting there uh, saying, don't do Kundalini. It is dangerous. It's the most dangerous form of yoga and like really like scaring them. And I'm like showing my parents this and they're just like, okay, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, well, let me try to explain this to you why it's dangerous. Cause it's like dangerous. Right. And I think we got into some of it speaking about the symptoms, but, um, I think there is a lot of reverence to be had as well. So maybe you could speak to like, uh, just unpacking more of what we've already talked about the potential dangers of mm. Kundalini. <laughs> Well, I want to share that the Kundalini Yoga, most of the Kundalini Yoga that's practiced here in the West and other parts outside of India is a different lineage, if you will. And then I believe what Sadhguru was referring to is the lineage that's mostly practiced in India, and they're actually quite different. Is that Himalayan Kriya Yoga? Or? It could be. I have, yeah, I'm I, not sure. I yet. don't know, actually. Um, but it's a very specific lineage that is practiced primarily out here when you would sign up to go to a kundalini yoga class and it's i wouldn't i wouldn't call it dangerous i would say pace yourself and if you need to take breaks take breaks it can be intense i would say that it's 
it will awaken things and it might make your whole world come crashing down. Yeah, ju just to be clear, like it's not going to Naomi's Kundalini class that would be dangerous. It's activating the dormant energy of Shakti and having a Kundalini awakening and the yeah. integration in that, that would be dangerous, <laughs> which also they say it's very rare that someone actually, this is just what I've heard. I I'm love to hear what you say, but I've heard that it's very rare that someone would experience a Kundalini awakening just by doing, going to a lot of Kundalini classes. Yeah. So. Like I said, I, would, I was practicing for a decade before, right. and then I stopped and put it down. But I do believe that the Kundalini classes and all the training primed me for that awakening. Exactly. And what, what Kundalini Yoga, the lineage that I teach, will do is it, we work with breath. We work with sound. We work with breath. And we work with um, Kriya, angles of the body, to awaken the channels of energy, the rivers of energy. And what we do is we develop a create a mixture of prana which is the life force on the breath and apana which is the heat and the mixture of those two things stimulates gently stimulates the kundalini energy so we might experience and some people don't at all and some people have to go and hold their feet because they're that susceptible and you know sensitive to the energy um which hasn't happened in class yet, but I've had to do that before. Sometimes people w will lay down and I start the gong and they start shaking. That happened to me last week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you were right in front of the gong. I too. was right in front of the ball, gong and I had a full on Bufo reactivation <laughs> and it was amazing. Yeah. So um, I would say if you're not ready for anything, how do I phrase this? If you want to stay comfortable in your life, even though it might not be for your highest good, then don't come to a Kundalini Yoga class. But if you're ready for some positive changes that might actually be very uncomfortable at first, then come experience it because it will, it will start to change your life. We, we work with sound because it, sound has the power to unobstruct um, clear blockages and then create a trajectory. Like the word mantrang, man is uh, the heart and the mind combined, and trang is the trajectory, the projection. So we're switching up the broadcast in our mind. So perhaps we had a broadcast going that was a story of, or a belief, a limiting belief, and then all of a sudden we're doing mantrang, and it's clearing that. And you're going from a negative thought loop all of a sudden to something very victorious, very powerful, very much more aligned with your spirit. Then that is inherently going to create change in your life because all of a sudden you have a different frequency. What is the importance of embracing a negative thought or belief? Um, well, like what we resist persists, right? So if we embrace it, we will ideally and give it a voice, understand it it can become integrated and we can work with it because as I said in class today, every negative thought inherently in it has a positive, the polarity. So if we have a negative aspect, a part of ourselves that is stuck on the same, on, on the opposite side of that stick, so to speak, is its superpower. So we don't want to discard the negative. We want to say, okay, I want to work with you because I know there's a superpower in you. <laughs> so let's tease it out. Let's work it. And like, pace ourselves with this, but like really get to understand what this negative aspect wants and needs and then let it transmute into the positive. hundred percent, hundred percent. And did the words toxic positivity mean anything to you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's what is really another thing to share about that. Um, we're, we're in such a density here on the planet that things tend to go negative until we infuse it with life force, until we bring our awareness to it, until we love it and nurture it. So we do want to go to that positive and focus there because we're so dense and negative. But ideally, ideally, we arrive at the central, at the neutrality. And I don't believe, because actually, if you talk about, there's a system in Kundalini Yoga, the tantric numerology, it goes from negative mind, which is the second body, to the positive mind, the third. It doesn't go negative to neutral. It goes negative to positive and from positive to neutral. Oh, that makes sense. Right? That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. 
Yeah, we have to find the balance. Like we, we have to go to the positive because it's the polarity of where we're likely at. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we find the neutrality so that we don't get triggered by those things anymore. And then w- there's this f- expression like positive, negative, neither will affect the yogi. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's something that I've become very um, passionate about, like, or what should I say, passionate against toxic positivity (laughs) you know i've been seeing it firsthand more and more as i've opened my eyes and been exposed to it but um i I appreciate you sharing all of that and especially why it's important to do our shadow work and i think the other thing too is like the shadow work doesn't always have to be hard and dense and sticky and difficult and all of that like if we can zoom out and be like I signed up for this. Like, this is what I chose, right? And like, these are my soul contracts and I'm into spirituality. Like now it's like, it's time for battle. It's go time. Like I've been learning about this stuff. Now I can apply the tools. Like what's the point of learning it if you're not going to apply the tools? It's all just theory then. Mm -hmm. And then when it happens to you, you're just going to be like, oh, poor me, victim mentality or (laughs) or mask it with positivity and act like everything is uh, wrong until your body fails on you, Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well put. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, All right. So Kundalini. So one thing we haven't really addressed is you took a little bit of break as a lot of Kundalini teachers did. Could you speak a little bit about what's been going on with uh, the Yogi Bhajan? Yogi Bhajan, yeah. Bhajan. Well, um, the unfortunate thing, like we find out about many spiritual teachers, uh, was that there was um, the more light someone had and more power someone had, the bigger the propensity to abuse it, unfortunately. And he was not um, exempt from that. <laughs> and so he, it came out uh, that there were a lot of sexual abuse and transgressions and abuses of his power, which um, shocked some people and confirmed what many people had suspected. And so it was, there was a tremendous painful rift in our community. Some people doubled down saying it didn't happen and you know, were basically shaming the victims. And then some people paused, I myself paused. I needed to step back because I was like, what is going on at this yoga that has transformed my life so wonderfully? Now I'm finding out, you know, and I never met him in body he had passed before I found the yoga, but um, I felt very connected to him as a spiritual father. And so I needed the pause. I'll just speak personally. I needed the pause. I needed to reflect. I stepped completely away. The pan- it was right when the pandemic started. I started drinking alcohol. I started. <laughs> and you weren't drinking at all? or None just of that. No, no alcohol? No alcohol, no cannabis, nothing. I was just complete straight edge. And... Um, yeah, it was kind of like I, I let loose. <laughs> yeah, right. Polarity. <laughs> exactly. I, I just let loose. I was like, well, can I swear here? I was like, of course, yeah. Fuck it, you yeah. know. And and like it was a wonderful experience to you know erase any judgment I had about that too. Like anything that if my spiritual my spiritual ego might have developed a judgment against any of that, it was just like okay clearing that that was what I felt like that experience was for just to neutralize it all Mm. and then quickly I learned okay that's not really great for me (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then slowly I started dipping my toes back into the practice like what do I want to do with it and then I had to remind myself like I was drawn to this yoga I didn't even know who this man was it wasn't until I started doing the teacher trainings that I really like, you know, they start indoctrinating you pretty much hardcore. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. It's awesome. a lot of videos of him and the yogi budget and this yogi budget and that, you know, but nowadays I feel like if you step into a Kundalini yoga pla- class and it's, um, and it's consciously led trauma informed class, they won't really mention him at all. You mm-hmm. won't hear me mention him. I've come in, in my heart, I've come to a place where I, have compassion and I don't demonize him. Um, you know, there's, I, I am actually so extremely grateful. Now, mind you, I was not directly abused by him. So I want to be very understanding, and respectful of people that 
were because they're here on this planet many of them and they suffered immensely from him and so there's there's a a way that I've learned to navigate the waters and come back full circle to teaching and sharing what I learned because of how life-changing and powerful it is and at the same time being very respectful and also keeping my own ego in check you know <laughs> yeah right and that's uh, you and I talked about that and that's something we could get into in terms of like uh, spiritual leaders and ego and narcissism and things like that that's uh, kind of fascinating uh, thank you for sharing all of that and w you know it's interesting because he created right now i'm getting into bikram it's funny i'm uh, i was a vinyasa guy and now i'm getting into the two forms of yoga that are attached to a person you know <laughs> and obviously bikram's got his thing like i'm not getting into bikram i'm getting into hot 26 right yep, you yep, know yep. but point being it's like it's the practice this is at least my viewpoint and like you said as well respect to all the victims people that experienced um anything from these people are in other situations as well. But these two specific situations, if the practice is working for you, it, we shouldn't be attaching a guru to it anyways, exactly. right? So it's very much a gift because now like when I hear that you were doing uh, Kundalini training and they were like plastering his face and videos with him everywhere that would have been so triggering for me and i would have been so caught up in my analytical mind being like do i surrender to this uh, what is this resistance teaching me but also my intuition is like this doesn't feel right so what do i do you know uh, i just don't think there should be like a top guru attached to anything they are messengers and we can receive the message and carry on and ironically or not so ironically one of the things he would always say was um be 10 times greater than me and strive for that and follow the teachings not the teacher that is ironic huh <laughs> yeah and that's great mm -hmm. and that was wisdom that was probably channeled through and that wasn't getting filtered through his ego you know right right yeah. very cool so what does it feel like to be back in the coon lee space now oh, i love it yeah, it feels good. I've, um, you know, you mentioned when you did your training that you didn't, you entered it not thinking you were going to teach, and then you're like, I have to share this stuff. So it's kind of how I feel now. It's like, I was given like these amazing teachings. I'm so grateful. Well, I don't want to hoard them, and like, I want to also open my throat when I teach. It's a very powerful thing. You open up the lotus of your throat, and you get out of your own way, and you just channel the teachings you know and you share from there and it's very spontaneous sort of flow and it's um it's also very humbling <laughs> and also we've we've been taught when you are there when you're teaching so to speak there's one student in the room and it's you wow mm -hmm. i i don't know if i've heard that i like it's a that. kundalini oh okay got it. yeah yeah <laughs> that's very cool mm-hmm like everyone there is your teacher. I mean, they're looking at you like teacher, but like yeah, you're yeah. looking at them like teacher. Mm. It's it, yeah. So it, there's no high, no, no low. There's no pyramid. Mm -hmm. A lot of humility. I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, Kundalini, I feel like we've done a pretty good job uh, <laughs> covering that. Mm -hmm. I know you're really into dreams and it, that fascinates me so much. Could you speak about dreams a bit? I'd love to speak about dreams. <laughs> Let's do it. So I don't know who told me this, but when I was 18 or 19 years old, somebody, some fairy woman came up to me and she's like, do you know about dream work? And I was like, what's that? And she said, just put a journal by your side and ask yourself a question each night before you go to sleep. And then when you wake up in the morning, just write down whatever dream you can remember. Even if it's one word and then later on you'll unlock it more, you know? And I was like, okay. And I started doing this work and it didn't work right away for me, but I would journal my dreams and lo and behold, my dreams started answering my questions and it would be in a way where it was maybe very symbolic or very metaphoric or very hilarious but i'm like what is going on i'm literally getting the answers to these questions through my dream so the ego goes to sleep and yes there can be a lot of subconscious purging that happens in dreams and 
it's a chance for your soul to communicate directly to you in your own languaging, in your own symbology, so to speak, and in your own sense of humor, too. So, <laughs> and the way that dreams work, it's such an uninhibited realm where there's so many different layers that your dream can answer. Like, I started getting up to, like, five questions a night. I'm like, can I answer five questions in one single dream? And sure enough, it was like the dream would have the setting. And here's something, Robert Moss, if you're interested in dream work, pick up a book by Robert Moss. He's a great, great teacher on dreams. Um, he shared one of the best tools, one of the first things you want to do when you interpret a dream is look at where you are. What's the setting? What's the environment? And that will tell you basically the subject of your dream, okay? And then you go from there. And this is where, this is so fascinating, but gestalt or parts work, if you will, you can apply that to dreams. And so say somebody walks into the room you're in, you've identified the room, and that person is not so random. Nothing in your dream is random. So you want to ask yourself when you're awake and you're trying to interpret the dream, what does this person mean to me? How do I feel about them? What is their message? Um, sometimes I'll be, I don't know, and I go, what's their birthday? Because my soul knows I like to look at astrology. <laughs> <laughs> and the crazy weird thing about your soul, your dream, your your soul in dream is that they have access to Akashic records. Hmm. So many times I've um, had somebody appear to me in dream and I'm like, I don't know what this person symbolizes to me. Maybe it's a timeline suggestion. And I go, this is okay. Don't judge me. I'll go to that person's Facebook and see if their birthday is listed. Okay. And I'm like, okay, that's, Oh, February. Okay. Maybe that's what, you know, and like astrologically, that's what, might be being communicated because my soul knows I like to talk in terms of tantric numerology and astrology and all that. And it blows me away. <laughs> it blows me away. I'm like, how did my soul know this birthday? And how did my soul know it would align with this? And things like that start happening where I'm just like, I can't even get, it's like, wow. And also like, just get used to it already. You know, <laughs> the get used to it already is a big one there. And I talk about this a lot, like with the bigness or synchronicities, whatever people will say like crazy. And it was like, no, say wild. We're, we're going to embrace it. Right. <laughs> and I've been saying that for years and a buddy recently shot Chris Hager. He said uh, to me, his new thing is of course. And as soon as he said that, I was like, Oh my God, that is it right there. Of course. Cause you're fully embracing it. Cause yeah. even wild, you're still like, that's wild, but yeah. there's still like a little bit of resistance. And this goes back to the gaslighting. Mm. Thank you for sharing all that with the dream. So, the challenging thing for dreams is a few things. One, having a dream that you remember, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what your order this is, but also <laughs> being like able to remember when you're in the dream space, everything you just said, like look for the setting, look for this. Another thing I've heard is, um, is it look at a clock? Mm. Do you know you that? You can one? look at a clock, you can flip a switch, but I that's like for lucid dreaming. I oh, don't okay. necessarily there's there's times where I will be conscious that I'm dreaming. Most of the time not. And it doesn't I want to just really impart this. It doesn't matter because if you can wake up and remember your dream, that's why you want to have your journal right there because you want to wake up and write down even a few words that will unlock more later. Um but as much as you can write down. It doesn't matter if you're awake in the dream or not. Um the dream will have messages. Whatever you remember is a message. And um, I want to share moving on some um, to more of the interpretation is to give every part of your dream a voice. That was tying in the Gestalt and parts work. Got it. Give yourself a voice in it. Narrate it. Mm -hmm. So to get to the essence. And Robert, one of Robert Monson's teachings, aside from locate yourself, what room are you and where are you or what does that mean to you? But also you get to the essence of the interpretation if this dream were a book, you're going to love this because you're a book writer. <laughs> if this dream were a book, what would its title be? And sometimes dreams have different parts. Okay, what is this chapter? And then what is this chapter called? And, what is this? and then you'll start to really glean all the juice from it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, dreams fascinate me so much, and I think this is going to motivate me to uh, put more intentionality, kind of like what you, you were talking about, I speak about as well, like the theta brainwave states and subconscious mind, and when you go to sleep and when you wake up and, you know, your, your empowering belief or whatever it is, but also your prayer 
you know, your intention for sleep. And I just feel so disconnected from my dreams. It's very rare that I have a dream and it's almost a big dream when I have one. And it's, it's, it's very like, clear message uh, maybe not clear but in hindsight it's like oh that was clear right of course of course yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um so one thing that helps me well first of all i'm going to put my journal at my bedside tonight um but the other thing is when i do wake up i don't sleep with the phone in my room so i'll have to like wake up in the middle of the night and like go get my phone to do this uh, in the kitchen where it's charging, but I'll leave myself a, a voice recording mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. And, and Eric Godsey, one, one of my t teachers, he recommended this. And he says, uh, it's funny when you go back and listen to it because you almost sound drunk. And it's true. Like you listen to yourself and you're like, it, it, maybe not drunk, but whatever it is, it's like you, you kind of remember saying it, you kind of don't. And then you just hear yourself, but it brings you back to that frequency and then things start to come. And the more you have like one piece of a dream come mm -hmm. through and you embrace that more and more things start to come and th that's when you start feeling awake in the dream you mm -hmm. know very yeah. cool yeah very cool yeah i love that um when you're asking a question at night like i was sharing with class today i went to sleep with a specific mantra in english an, an affirmation because i just I, I know that through practice like if you set the intention like that you'll have better sleep and you'll have a a perhaps hopefully a profound dream and um one thing you want to be mindful of i just want to share is that when you're if say you're writing out your question at night I, I i recommend dating your journal and writing out the question um you want to address yourself or address spirit or something very trusted you know and then you want to ask a question in the way where it's open-ended so not like a should i or shouldn't i or a yes or no the dream realm is so open, so don't limit it, you know, just like show me, ask to be guided, show me or show me inspiration about this or that, or if I did this, what would it bring? Like, so it leaves room and space for your dream you to explore things with you. I like that. I yeah. like that a lot. And when you are in the dream world, do you feel like that is home and this is just like the play and that's really like coming back to your soul? Mm, not so much, actually. Okay. I, I've heard that before and I can see that. And also, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's just a different type of reality. Mm hmm it feels very real in it, right? You know, if I, I've had dreams where I'm running errands in my dream and I wake up and I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm like, darn it. Yeah. Um, but, um, it's, it's, it's just, a it's just a different, you know, the brain waves are different and it's a different realm. And yes, I feel very much like connected. I've had, uh, connections to teachers in that realm that I would probably never experience here. And in that sense, yes, it's very real. And mm -hmm. this is all a dream here. And I know that that is a, um, I believe the Aboriginal people look at it that way. The dream space is the reality. And here we are asleep in the dream. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the part where I don't know that I have like a strong opinion either way, but like in terms of like someone said in a ceremony once, there is no death. 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 Just on loop for like two minutes. And it was it, like all is one. And of course, and all that, right? Like that was around the time that I was really starting to feel that like a few months before that. So it was like really good confirmation for me to not like gaslight myself. And even how you played a track from um, uh, the East Force album, Ram Dass. He's got a song, song called on that East Force that is uh, Soul Land, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I think of the movie Soul, where they're in the whimsical blue type mm -hmm. place, and that's where the soul is. And I see that in terms of like our higher self, our soul, like in another dimension, but also like fractals out and dimensions and planets. But I don't know that that's the same thing as dreamland, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, it feels like an astral walking of sorts, mm. you know? Um, I feel like we're given, we're privy to certain probabilities in dream. I don't feel dreams are always prophetic by any stretch of the imagination. I feel like they're, um, sometimes they'll 
heed us to make a timeline jump or something or show us a lot of times we'll be shown something if we don't want it to happen then don't do it you know I, such great advice <laughs> yeah <laughs> Right. And, you know, my teachers say, like, take yeah. that advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like if you're deciding between two things, here's one of my teachers told me this. If you're deciding between two things and you're not clear, flip a coin, s decide which side is which, flip a coin. And if you're upset with the result, there's your answer. <laughs> like, <laughs> so true. I've, I've gone into this thing um, in recent years on and off uh, when I'm in hard times. Like it, this started about five years ago. And then last year, for the first time, I started doing it again. Like I didn't do it for like four years because frankly, it's kind of silly and dumb. <laughs> but, but to your point, like, thank you for saying that. Anyways, I would uh, just go into my phone and open up uh i use chrome or do i use safari i think i use chrome whatever it is uh not duck duck go if you guys are wondering but i just type in coin flip and as soon as you type in coin flip it flips a coin for you and then uh, i tell myself it's the first one you know and then okay best of three and and, and then i've gotten to this place of being like okay well that gave me my answer of what yeah, i of what, what i you want. Really want but it's nice to hear <laughs> you say that and then pendulums are so interesting yeah. do you work with pendulums no i work with tarot but this in in the same regard like um with it's like muscle testing it'll show you what you really want or wh what it was really in your frequency and um i think tarot is the same and um i used to if i didn't like the results of a tarot card i would do okay best two out of three right and i had a my psychic advisor at the time called me out on it i you know he was able to see and he called it psychic masturbation <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, that's a good one i i just did that a couple of days ago you had a zoom call which we'll talk about your uh your infinity, infinity breath, breath. Mm -hmm. um it, it, we'll get to that but on your zoom call you mentioned how ray ray had been seeing squirrels a lot recently and I, I don't know if it was that day or it might have been the next day, but uh, I was walking to the ocean here in Santa Cruz. I looked up and I saw a couple people uh, looking up at the sky and I'm like, is that a bald eagle? <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, all good. And it was sure enough, it was a bald eagle. Wow. And I was, and I started talking with these people and apparently it's nest is near the ocean right there. And there's a few more bald eagles. So I got home and I opened up my Oracle deck, my animal one. And I was like, oh, I'm going to pull the bald eagle card because this is for sure messenger, right? You know, all cocky about it, right? I got the squirrel. And uh, uh, I was like, wait, squirrel just came up. And I just wrote about a squirrel a few days ago too. And I'm like, that's three. Okay, clearly it's squirrel. But then again, I, I went again. I was like, okay, this time I'm going to pull the bald eagle. You started masturbating. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's hilarious. Squirrel is one of my totem. I see squirrel. Once my dad died, um, I started seeing squirrel everywhere. Squirrel, I, speaking of dreams, I had a very profound dream once where I walked in and immediately there was like a, a circle of people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I know all these people, but I didn't. But immediately when I saw them, it was like, oh, hi. It, you know, like I had known them from the other side. And I felt like they were my counsel. And believe it or not, in one of the chairs was a squirrel. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and he was very opinionated. I had a lot to say. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. This was in the dream, and in it was dream? your counsel, like your spirit guides, you'd mm -hmm, say? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And anything the squirrel had to say to you that you'd want to share? If not, that's cool, too. You know, he... I, he well, I was given some choices, which was really interesting, and, you know, they ran them by me, and I decided upon one, like, wholeheartedly, and they said, okay, and he was, like, he was the one that was like, are you sure? Are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. He's like, okay, then we will support your free will. Yeah. Solid. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, last topic here as we begin to wrap up, but uh, ETs, anything uh, come up for you just talking about aliens? You know, I've never made contact other than I feel um, when I was once camping in Mount Shasta, which feels like, you know. Of course, Shasta, of Lumerian course, land. Of course. Yeah. I'm laying there, and I just heard, um, we'll work on you, but you need to lay in a different position. 
And I was like, say what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they told me I was like closed, like my body, I had my legs crossed or something. Or I was on my side with my legs crossed. And they said, lay on your back with your palms face up and your feet, hips width apart. And we'll do some healing on you. And they didn't identify themselves. I went to sleep. I had a great night's sleep. And, you know, but um, I mean, I'm fascinated by the subject and yeah. learning, like I mentioned, Matthias this morning and Asha and Adin. So I'm just kind of starting to learn about all of that but yeah um, I'm more I'm more curious what you have to say <laughs> yeah I, I mean I have a lot that I'm curious about I feel like uh, I've been doing this podcast now five years and I'd say the first three wow time flies it's it's wild um the first three years two really I was like deep in it for sure I think around 2022 I started to like ground and become a human again because <laughs> I was just so deep into being the doing the work and being in the work really um but now it, it kind of comes and goes uh, a buddy of mine shout out to Adam Douglas here in town he's doing a book club and he doesn't believe in aliens and somehow we uh, came on the topic a uh, uh, a few of us and he was starting his book club and I go, Hey, why don't you do Dolores Cannon's three wave of volunteers for your book? He had no idea what it was <laughs> a week later. He's like, yeah, I'm doing that book you recommend. I'm like, dude, do you know that 700 pages, 17 hour listen, <laughs> you know, long story short though, he's doing a, uh, this book club here in Santa Cruz at creative Eden lounge. Shout out to Shannon, her place, really cool place. And they have, uh, the second book club tomorrow for the three waves. And he's bringing in a QHHT practitioner named Jen, which is so cool because QHHT is the style of hypnosis that Dolores Cannon created to go beyond past lives of on this planet. It's of all planets in all dimensions. Uh, so we're doing a group hypnosis tomorrow. What time? Yeah, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll get you the info after. I think it's like three or four or something okay. like that. Yeah, it, it's going. It, that sounds it, great. Yeah, and like deal wise, like talk about a deal. Like a one one hypnosis is like five hundred bucks wow. for one of those. So um, yeah, it, I'm really looking forward to that. In terms of ET stuff, I've shared something with you, I think, and I probably mentioned it a few times on this podcast. But back in. Uh, 2020, I was in this mastermind called Fit for Service uh, Fellowship, uh, very, very cool, and I was in that for two years, and we were going to Tahoe in July or something of 2020, so we can all go back and be like, oh, wow, that was just a few months in to the lockdowns, and we were very much, I traveled more than I ever did in my life in 2020 and 21, so there's a lot to be said for that mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of opinions, <laughs> um, right? It, that doesn't even be said. Mm -hmm. So we were in Tahoe and that was also when that wild fire happened in Santa Cruz and it was apocalyptic. Yeah. Yeah. You remember that? I do. How can you forget, right? Yeah. yeah. For people that don't live out here, I mean, the sky and outside and you walk outside and it was just straight red for how many days? A week or something? Yeah. Wow. At least three to, three to four days. Yeah. But, you know, longer. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of devastation. So my, I grew up in Gilroy and my parents still live there, not far from Sankers. I'm driving to Tahoe and I get a text from my dad and he's just going through their stuff just in case they need to evacuate. And he goes, he sends me a picture picture of a necklace. He goes, I found this in your little kid stuff. You want it? Cause he knew I was going through like an alien phase or <laughs> what, whatever at the time. And he sends me a picture and I don't really think too much of it. I look at it, I'm like, Oh, I forgot about that necklace. But it was from when I was a kid and it was a necklace with a icon of a blue alien, not a green alien, you know, and probably like a cheap necklace that I got at some point in my life. And then the next day at the summit, this, this woman walks up to me and I didn't really know her at the time. Now, four years later, she's one of my best friends, not for this reason. It just turned out that way, but we didn't really know each other. And she was just having a lot of channeling, uh, come online for her. And that's another thing like the, we can call them psychic gifts. That's another like gift that comes on when you awaken the Kundalini as well. So I hear, you know, it hasn't come online for, well, clear cognizance, but, um, anyways, I'll wrap this up. So she has this channel message for me and she goes, you're not from this planet. And I just kind of <laughs> laugh. I'm like, 
what else you got? I know that, <laughs> you know, but I was like, oh, interesting. Cause things come in threes and I just had the necklace come in. Mm -hmm. And then I don't remember what the third one is. I used to tell the story so much more, but my friend Celeste, shout out to her as well. She, she, um, she gave me a Lumerian crystal to sleep with that mm. night. Yeah, so that was powerful. Nothing happened with that. But then she goes, hey, what'd you say um, in your Akashic records reading, uh, what kind of alien they say you were? And I was like, Arcturian. So at the time, you know, Googled it. And sure enough, the Arcturians mm -hmm. are blue. Yep. And it's not your typical, like, green alien you would see like for a little kid thing it, it's a blue like it looks like the arcturians and i'm like all right i'm listening so i've really tried hard to call in ets and all that for like two three years and then i was like all right time to be a human again but i i saw i had a good U, ufo story that i'll link to in this podcast where a few of us um unpacked a ufo we saw which was just absolutely incredible that was mm powerful night so i'll link it in the show notes but yeah still still kind of waiting i have, I have mm -hmm. friends that are really connected mm -hmm. and those aren't my stories to share and i've seen some of them too and it's, it's wild and i mean for me it's a uh, i try to stay out of the mainstream stuff i don't know about you but like i get like quote unquote 3d friends sending me things about like alien spottings i'm just i'm just kind of immune to it and mm -hmm. it's like you can feel the the propaganda and, mm -hmm. and the agenda yeah. yeah yeah i saw a craft once and it's interestingly it was right near bohemian grove if you heard of that and uh it was in the middle of the night and i happened to be on lsd but I happen to also think that when you are on that frequency, you are, you know, I don't think somebody that wasn't on LSD would have seen what I saw. You're seeing through the veil, yeah. Exactly. And uh, it was very quiet. It had like very um, distinct lights. And my partner at the time saw it too. And we were like, it was, it felt so close. We could almost touch it, but it was quiet. It was so quiet. Like it's not running on fuel. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it was just like hopping into the dimension and then it left. And we were both like, wow, that was definitely something not from here. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And have you seen the disco ball? No. I, I call it the disco ball. I've seen it a few times, but and sometimes on medicine, sometimes off. Um, so that's important to stay, say as well. But it it's almost looks like we're in a dome, like when you're looking at the night stars and you see like past the stars and you can start to see it kind of looks like a disco ball of like a dome. That's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing. And then it, Dolores Cannon gets in. So there's the dancing stars. Um, I started to UFO hunt, and I noticed that stars will telepathically communicate with you if you look at them. Yeah. Yeah, the dancing stars. Yeah. And the Dolores Cannon stuff is activating because I'm just starting to get back into it because of this book club. And then the next night uh, after listening to something, I went outside and I just looked up and it was mm. a massive one that was like totally dancing and just doing this whole thing. And when you look at it, it almost looks like you're looking through, like uh, you're piercing through the galaxy or the, mm. the sky and like going into another portal. And that's a good way to build your intuition too, just communicating mm. with the stars. Anyway, this star getting drawn out. Um, Naomi, thank that. you so much for taking the time. This has been awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Tell us about Infinity. Infinity Breath. Uh, Infinity Breath is a monthly course. We start at the top of the month. I share a sequence of breath techniques that just make you feel awesome. And then the idea is you practice it every day or you get to it as often as possible. And then we start again at the top of the month. We have live pop-ups once a week. We get together and we do the routine and then we explore dream realm. We do gestalt. We mind map. We talk about astrology and and yeah, build community in that way. So awesome. And if people are interested, uh, what's the best way to learn more? Um, you can find me on Instagram.com forward slash Naomi and then three underscores wilder. <laughs> and you can just click the link in the show notes and it'll take you right there. Reach there out to <laughs> Naomi and, um, anything else that you want to share that you're working on or, um, that's pretty much cool. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Sweet. Well, thank you so much. This has been awesome. And hopefully we do it again sometime. Yeah. And thank you for how you're showing up in the world and sharing your light and Likewise. being authentically yourself. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Yeah.